Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again to another in our series of interview with the experts. I'm your host uh, for this uh, session, uh, Malcolm Bell, and it gives me great uh, pleasure today to uh, introduce a, a very special uh, a guest, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Mohammed Dalkouli, who's a professor of medicine and as uh, an interventional cardiologist uh, with uh, expertise that uh, covers uh, many different procedures, but uh, included in those is his vast experience of left atrial appendage uh, closure. Uh, and so the, today's topic is uh, left atrial appendage occlusion or anticoagulation <coughs> for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. So, Mohammed, uh, welcome uh, uh, to, to our uh, interview here. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's just start off with you know, a very simple question. Uh, patients with atrial fibrillation, why, why do they need to take anticoagulants? Right, so you know, atrial fibrillation by definition is irregular rhythm that imp primarily impacts the top chamber of the heart. Left atrium is ineffectively contracting, so there is less uh, emptying or less effective emptying of blood in the atrium, which leads to blood stagnation and eventually can lead to clot formation. The clot can then eventually exit the heart and travel and cause most likely stroke, but can also lead to uh, you know occlusion of arteries and other parts of the of the body. So that's why atrial fibrillation is by you know uh, by definition associated with higher risk of having a stroke. And and, and we know that this tends to occur uh, maybe at, at any age, but particularly as uh, people be, uh, get older. Uh, can you give us an idea of what the prevalence of atrial fibrillation and the patients at risk of this? Uh, let's say uh, from middle-aged onwards? Yeah, so, you know, with the aging of the population, we see more and more of this. So there is an estimated 12 million people in the United States now with atrial fibrillation, which, you know, this estimate has surpassed all of the prior old secular estimates that were made 20, 30 years ago. It does increase by age, as you alluded to. So if you're over 80 years of age, then the likelihood of you having atrial fibrillation is north of 10%. And it's much less if you're like less than 50 years of age. And then it goes in between between the two ranges. And of course, you know, we, we're here to talk about prevention of stroke, you know, in, in these patients. It obviously uh, can be a, a, you know, a devastating uh, complication. Um, but let's just move on because the um, one of the things we want to discuss today is left atrial appendage occlusion and uh, <clears throat> as a potential alternative to anticoagulation. So uh, for those of our audience who, who don't work uh, in uh, in this area, and particularly you're working in the cath lab, can, can you just explain what left atrial appendage occlusion is. Yeah, I'll be happy to. So maybe we'll just give the historical context. Uh, you know, blood centers have been the cornerstone of preventing a stroke. You have blood stagnation. If you use a blood center, you're less likely to form a clot for many, many years. However, people realize that uh, a good proportion of patients cannot take a blood center. And even among those who start to take a blood center, they drop it off over the next couple of years. And it's estimated that maybe only 30 to 40% of pe people who are indicated to be on a blood center actually do take it for the long term. So that unmet need prompted people to search for an alternative. And, uh, you know, blood center is a systematic approach where you're sending the blood throughout the body. Um, so the the search has led to this concept that most of the uh, clots do form in the side pouch of the left atrium. That's known as the left atrial appendage. And maybe if we if we close that pouch uh, without impacting other things in the body, then we will prevent stroke effectively. So left atrial appendage occlusion is the closure of the appendage, which is a side pouch of the left atrium that can be uh, undertaken either by percutaneous means or surgically? Now, surgically, uh, I, I think maybe we can just um, maybe pass on that uh, briefly. But, but nevertheless, I mean, this is usually for someone who is having some other cardiac surgery that uh, we would then uh, offer, you know, <clears throat> closure at the time. It would be uncommon for us to do an appendage closure as the only reason for cardiac surgery. Is that uh, is that very uncommon. Yeah, it can be done minimally invasively, but it's very uncommon. I only mentioned this is because there was a large randomized trial published in the last year that really demonstrated or documented for the first time uh, an advantage of uh, doing left atrial appendage occlusion surgically on top of blood center. But we could we could leave that on the side and focus on the transcatheter approach. 
Yeah, so these percutaneous approaches, and I think the, uh, the device that you know, many people would be familiar with is the Watchman device, uh, probably the most commonly used. Uh, uh, but there are some other devices. Can you tell us uh, how many and uh, whether these uh, have you know, similar efficacy and safety uh, to the Watchman device? Absolutely. So the Watchman device was approved in 2015, so about eight years ago. Uh, it has now, you know, we have a second generation, a third generation of it. So it has evolved over time. It's the most commonly used in the U.S. There is a second device called Amulet. It's slightly different mechanism, but sort of does the same job. Um, that is also approved. So only two currently approved in the U.S. A few more are used in Europe and a lot more in the pre pre-human testing. And we've talked about, you, you use the term transcatheter or percutaneous. Um, how long does this procedure uh, take? Uh, is it done under local anesthetic, moderate sedation, or do you need to have a general anesthetic? Uh, maybe you can just describe uh, to our listeners uh, how this yep. is uh, typically done. Yeah, so uh, first of all, this is a venous procedure, right? So we typically don't get arterial access, which lowers the risk of bleeding. Um, the vast majority of cases in the country are still undertaken under general anesthesia. Uh, we at Mayo have switched to moderate sedation about four years ago, and I would say 99% of our cases are done with moderate sedation. Uh, skin to skin is about an hour or less, and uh, most of our patients are discharged home same day. And so then the question comes up, you know, who should have anticoagulation and who should have a left atrial appendage closure? And, and I can think of perhaps of your know, two groups of patients. You, you have a, um, a group of patients that may have a very high risk of bleeding, or maybe they've had active you know, bleeding. And this you know, is obviously a, a good alternative you know, to, to at least uh, consider. On the other hand, you know, we have many patients who may not have had a bleed, but may be fearful of a bleed. And they uh, may say, well, if I, uh, if I don't need to take anticoagulants and there's a device I could have instead, I, I'd rather have the device. So maybe you could just uh, briefly tell us, you know, uh, who are the patients that uh, typically uh, uh, we would offer left atrial appendage occlusion? And particularly, I guess, you know, uh, what situations is it actually approved for and, and, and reimbursed? And I love your classification. I think that simplifies it a lot. So you have the patients who've had a problem with the blood thinners and those who are afraid of a problem, right? So as of today, 10, 10, 2023, 20, we can only offer this therapy to the first category of patients, patients who've had a problem with the blood thinner. If you read the FDA label or CMS label, it says that people who are indicated to be on a blood thinner to prevent a stroke, but have an appropriate rationale to seek an alternative therapy, it's kind of broad. But what we see in clinic is somebody had a GI bleed or a brain bleed or had a fall or uses a cane at a high risk of fall. These are the vast majority of our patients. Um, it is not approved yet for somebody who just doesn't like a blood thinner or doesn't want to be on a blood thinner. However, there are two large randomized trials, one from each company, from each device. Um, there are, that, that should be coming up in the next year or two with the results. Each is about in the 3000 range of uh, patient enrollment that are trying to address the second population. So patients who don't have a reason to seek an alternative to a blood thinner, but just don't want to be on a blood thinner for a long time. So I would say that that is in the future, well, it remains to be seen, but as of today, somebody who's had a problem with a blood thinner is an appropriate person to be referred to the clinic. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are you know, probably patients listening to this or physicians who were referring or taking care of patients with atrial fibrillation would uh, be very excited to, you know, to hear the results of, of those trials that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, but there's always a risk, isn't there, you know, with any invasive uh, procedure. So maybe uh, it seems simple enough to uh, close off this uh, appendage with a special uh, device, uh, you know, moderate sedation in 30 or 40 minutes. But what are the risks? Yeah, the, you're right, exactly right. There is nothing, with, there's no free lunch. Um, the procedural risks fortunately have really come down significantly over time. So now we caught about one to 2% risk of any complication, less than 1% risk of major complication in our practice. But that's just the procedural complication, you know, uh, around the procedure. Um, there are a couple of things that haven't been completely resolved yet with the long-term uh, sequelae of the device. One of them is the propensity or the likelihood of forming a clot on the device itself. That's called device-related thrombus. 
that still occurs in about two to four percent of the patient. Not a high number, but considering this is a preventative procedure, right? We want to be careful of that. Uh, is that something that occurs early, uh, within the first few weeks or months, or uh, beyond that? Unfortunately, it happens throughout, but the for the the highest number of uh, observed cases are in the first six months. But we have had seen cases later on, so so that risks and it, until today it hasn't been resolved. The, the newer generation of the Watchman device has a coating, a drug coating on the device to try to prevent that. But that's one risk we usually discuss with the patient. This is all odds of different things happening, right? Are you going to have a stroke? Are you going to have a DRT or nothing or bleeding? So so we're playing with a lot of odds. Uh, that is really the major one. There there is a smaller risk of you know the device not sealing completely because the appendage anatomy is extremely variable. Uh, that has been associated with a slight increase of adverse event over the long time, long term, but not, not a substantial increase. So device-related thrombus, in my opinion, remains the, the one sticky, sticking point for, for long term. Now, just going back to the reason why you're going to put these in in the first place is to prevent stroke. So uh, how effective is it as preventing stroke? I mean, what, what would be the risk of stroke after uh, having one of these devices uh, placed, maybe compared to someone who's taking anticoagulation and maybe compared to someone who cannot take anticoagulation or refuses to take it? Yeah, so if you look at all kind of strokes and the randomized trials, there was no difference between taking blood thinners versus doing a device. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, I don't know if it's appropriate for for this you know kind of audience, but I think it is it is important for people to know that uh, the mechanism is mostly by preventing bleeding strokes. When you take away the you know the risk of of hemorrhagic stroke by eliminating blood centers, the watchman does great, or the device left atrial appendage exclusion does great. But there is a slight increase in ischemic strokes if you stop the warfarin too. But if you combine all together any kind of stroke, you get numerically similar numbers. And we tell the patient, you know, with blood centers, we know in the literature, blood centers reduce the stroke risk by fifty. So if your stroke risk was 6%, it'll be 3%. It's never zero, uh, but that we, we caught similar, you know, uh, performance between the two based on the trials. So, Mohammed, you know, one of your other um, major interests and, and contributions has really uh, focused on innovation. Um, and as we think about this device, maybe you could just, as we finish here, or we'll wrap this up, can you give us perhaps a little glimpse into the future of how these devices may be improved? And secondly, um, uh, do we have tools that we can predict who's going to be better off having a left atrial appendage occlusion uh, versus either no therapy or uh, anticoagulation? Yeah, thank you. Very good question. So on the first one, uh, what does the future hold? I think the future 10 years from now will be devices with very, very low footprint. Uh, and they're already around the corner now. There are devices that you can go and twist the appendage and close it and leave a really a tiny knob there. Uh, I think people will be excited if it's effective in the closure mechanism to have that versus having a large device with you know chances of problems on it in the future. Uh, as far as prediction, that has been our an interest of ours, and I, I don't think we have anything effective now. We use, even even predicting stroke in general, we use a very old historic crude score, as you all know, the Chad Vask score. But predicting who should do this versus that, we're doing some work with flow dynamics to see, you know, if you have this pattern of flow, would you do better with this and that? That's something to to you know watch out for the future but as of today we don't really have a good predictor unfortunately well unfortunately that's all the time we have uh, today but i mean i think this has been a very uh, good discussion i think uh, some important information uh, uh, presented here and also uh, i think it just gives us a real glimpse into the future about what uh, may uh, we, we may expect you know, to see for our patients in the future so thank you so much uh, for spending the time with us uh, today yeah. and uh, look forward to further updates uh, in this area. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.